my shopping bag. I have not done a my shopping bag video in a while, but uh, I had some random things lying around, and uh, here we go. So the the idea behind this uh, this format is, I just had stuff that I bought that doesn't really fit any other themed video, so let's just you know try them in a complete mix of genres and uh, see what happens. All right, so. As you can see, we have got two whiskeys, one American, one Scottish. We have got a rum from Mexico. And we have got an Aromori. More on the Aromori in a moment. And let me finish pouring these. Wow, the... Uh, the Uropan and the Glenlivet actually have a very similar color, despite a very significant difference in age. Okay, let's get to these. Um, let's get right into it. All right, first off, uh, Yoka Koji Ryokyu Awamori. So Awamori is the traditional spirit of Okinawa. Um, it, to some extent, you, you, it's most known as a predecessor to shochu, but that is, that's a bit unfair. It's, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's kind of its own thing. Um, so uh, what you've got here is um, folks in Okinawa looking to Thailand, to distilling traditions in Thailand, um, sort of borrowing them and then improvising on, on that basis. So they're using uh, the, the base material for this, base starch material, is uh, long grain, Thai rice, not short grain rice, which tends to go into sochu. This is long, the long grain Thai stuff, um, and but and then it's uh, but then it's fermented with koji as as you would in shochu, although it's only fermented once. <coughs> um, and aside from that, you see the, some of the same kinds of stuff. You see uh, 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 atmospheric or or uh, uh, vacuum pot distillation. Um, and uh, uh, so, so let me back up. So uh, koji fermentation, koji is basically a, 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 you can think of it as related to chu in, in baijo, but it's really all, 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 it's kind of its own thing too. It's a mix of, uh, among other things, mold. Um, and in uh, Okinawa, they, they, in, in Awamori, they only use black mold. And in shochu, you'll see a more, a broader collection of molds being used. And that's what kind of forwards the fermentation process. Um, now, this one is, I think this is specifically made for the American market, or at least it's the first I've seen hit Chicago. Uh, now, this gets a four-day ko koji prop propagation followed by the main fermentation of 22 days. That is apparently a very long period of, of koji uh, propagation. Um, and then the, you got, you got house yeast, uh, atmospheric pot, pot still distillation, the, uh, the actual distillery is in uh, Tomigutsuku uh, in Okinawa. And, um, oh, and it's bottled at 43% alcohol by volume, which is relatively high for traditional Japanese spirits, including Awamori. All right, let's, uh, let's get into this. I'm darn excited. I think this is the first Japanese spirit I've had on the show. On the nose. Initially, this is extremely subtle. This is this is really subtle. I mean, coming to this from you know Baijo world, I was expecting like a big old explosion of of uh, you know weird moldy funkiness, but that's not really what this is about. This is extremely understated. Initially, I am getting a little bit of an ethanol note. That's there, but then this there's this kind of a very nice. Um, frankly, just a nice sake note, honestly. Like, um, what kind of sake? Like, a nothing too refined. Like, like a good, uh, Junmai Ginjo or something like that. So you're getting a little bit of funk, but, but there's some, some fruit in there as well. Um, some new potatoes. Freshly, you know, freshly dug up potatoes. A lot of, like, musty cellar stuff like dank musty cellar like uh 
mushrooms, portobello mushrooms maybe. And just this very light fruitiness, almost, um, it's not actual fruit, it's almost more like um, a keto breath, if you've ever um, done a low carb diet and this is, you know, that, that smell that your breath starts to get after like day seven, that's kind of showing up here. It's nice, it's lovely, it's, it's almost too understated for me, but I'm gonna add some water to this and see what happens. All right, on the palate. Oh, much more going on on the palate than the nose. Um, so we got a kind of like a, a candy thing, like um, like sweet tarts, but without the tart part. So that kind of thing. Um, mushrooms, lots of mushroomy notes. Mushrooms like sauteed in like light soy sauce. Um, there's a lot of minerality. There's a lot of rocks in this. Fresh new potatoes again, that kind of dank cellar note. Um, some fennel. And there's this kind of maritime character of this. Uh, almost like a... There's something Pulteney, but it's almost almost more reminds me of like Northern Italian white wine, like an Arnace or something. So old Pulteney meets an Arnace. That makes sense? Thank you. Soft mouthfeel. It's very crisp, especially on the finish. This is not something that's going to dominate your palate, especially not your nose. It's not, it's just not how it plays the game. Um, I mean, what it feels like is, this feels like it's meant to go with food, honestly. Um, I could see, you know, drinking a ton of this with like, I don't know, light, light fish preparations, that kind of thing. Um, um, noodles, uh, <clears throat> like rice bowls, that, you know. But more than that, I mean, like you could you could drink this with salad, honestly, and it wouldn't it wouldn't sort of blow out the salad, which is saying a lot considering we're talking about distilled spirits here. All right, moving on though, I'll come back to that when when uh, once it's had time to settle down and and uh, with the water. Moving on to the European Charanda Añejo from Michoacan in Mexico. Now, uh, the predecessor to this bottle kind of was one of my favorite spirits of 2020, I think it was, because it, uh, so, so basically what's, what was going on in the, the basic blue level, blue label uh, European is a blend of half pot distilled cane juice rum and pot, half, you know, multi-column distilled molasses based rum. Um, and they sold it for 25 bucks for a liter and I still feel like it's one of the best, you know, rail rums you can use. I mean, it's, it's you can build an entire cocktail arsenal around around the Europe and Blue Label. There's also an Agricola, which I like a lot, and which is actually better. That's the 100% cane juice stuff. But the, it's always been the Blue Label. It's always felt more dangerous to me. And this is basically that aged in bourbon barrels for I don't know exactly how long. Um, Ooh. But we shall see uh, see what that does. This is bottled at 46% alcohol by volume. So my hope with this is this can play kind of the same role as the uh, the, the basic um, unaged rum can do. So can you use this as basic you know as basically a rail I don't know dark rum or aged or lightly aged rum something like that? We shall see. On the nose of this. I mean, initially what I'm getting is like a almost a budget Claren Ancient, like budget aged Claren. This reminds me a lot of those, um, the aged Clarens that I've had, particularly the bourbon barrel aged ones. So I'm getting olives, kiwi, um, just lots of fruit, kiwi, mangoes, uh, um, 
hint of banana in there. Uh, it's very maritime, seawater, fennel. Pineapple, no, but it's like toasted pineapple. Um, maraschino liqueur and vanilla. I think both of those are coming from the vanilla, from the, uh, the bourbon cask. There's some kind of more subtle than that. There's some white pepper. Some cinnamon. There's kind of a, of a mint note. It's, uh, it's not fresh mint though. It's, um, it's almost like mint that's been muddled in some bitters, like some Peychaud's or something. There's a little hint of like a aniseed or something in there too. A couple more, uh, a little more minerality, a couple of pebbles. And then, you know, the, uh, but the, um, the column distilled stuff is in there too. So there's like a little squirt of whipped cream on top of everything. This is pretty righteous actually on the nose. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm excited on the palate. Okay, so initial impression, this is much more, so the nose is a little bit wild. The nose is heading in a little bit into Clarence territory, although it's, it's cleaner than a lot of the aged Clarence that I've had. The palette is um, much more straightforward, much more buttoned up, which is fine. Again, this is the question I'm, I'm, I'm bringing up is, is whether this can be a rail rum. Yeah, lots, lots of vanilla, cokey notes. The column pre stuff is, is much more present here. Yeah, so vanilla coke. Um, we're still getting olives, lots of olives. Um, sweet tea, fly, fried plantains, fennel, that kind of briny thing, the, the seawater, sea salt, you know, sea rocks kind of thing. A little bit of a dried cherry note. Mm. White pepper again, cinnamon stick, lots of cinnamon stick on this. There is actually a general kind of Christmas spicy character to this. Um, a little bit of a of an herb, of an herbal thing. Um, I don't know. It's hard to tell. Some, something halfway between basil and mint. Um, in terms of the development, this is very front forward. It has like this big, big, big arrival on everything I talked about, and then it kind of like um, it doesn't go further back in my mouth than that. Water will probably improve that. I would, I would expect it to, but. We shall see, you know, so, but at the moment, this is mostly towards the, all, everything is happening towards the front of my mouth, but the finish at the front of my mouth kind of hangs on for a good length of time. So there's that. I like it. I like it. Um, did I mention this is 30 bucks, 30 bucks per liter of this? All right. So I'm going to give this a quart of water and we'll come back to it. Again, no particular organization to these, except I'm just going up by ABV. All right, this is one uh, I've been meaning for, to buy for a while, but I kind of held off on it until recently. Glenlivet, 12-year-old illicit still, single malt scotch whiskey. Uh, now there's some no nonsense story about, you know, the original illicit distilling tradition in Scotland, yada, yada, yada. But the, I mean, the important story is this is basically uh, Glenlivet malt whiskey. Uh, they don't say, but presumably um, mostly bourbon matured or matured in whatever those, you know, ridiculous Frankenstein casts that they're using right now. Um, matured in that. And it is uh, bottled at 48% alcohol by volume. And it is non chill filtered at that. No mention about color, but, you know, we can't have everything. All right, so the reason why I am excited about this is because way back in the day, there used to be this 16-year-old uh, Glenlivet called N N Nadura, which was um, bottled at higher proof. It was close to 60%, uh, all bourbon cask, and it was delightful. I loved that stuff. It was not expensive, and um, 
it was just a great, you know, hit of bourbon cask space side that I could get, you know, anytime I wanted to. And now it's gone. There is there have been a couple of other Nadiros scents that are not as good, but I want that back. And I'm hoping that this bottling will ca will capture a little bit of that magic. All right. So on the nose, yeah, we're getting there. It's li it's it's um it's very space side. It's very Glenlivet. We're getting apples, pears. There's some black tea in this, like some Ceylon tea, maybe. Um, cafe drinks, like a nice latte. Uh, white pepper. And honey, a mix, mix of honeys, really. It's uh, clover honey is in there. Definitely that very, you know, aromatic top... Uh, top dominant kind of floral honey but also heavier honeys like there's some, some maybe some honeydew in in there maybe some manuka honey uh vanilla there's some like muesli in this it's kind of you know been in the fridge all night it's also quite floral there's some uh some wildflowers in this and really just a lot of like straightforward barley stuff. Um, I mean, it smells like a Speyside whiskey, which I appreciate. I like that. Um, <clears throat> I like that they haven't thrown this in some ridiculous Carcavelos cask or something. All right. Um, let's see what happens on the palate. Here we go. Similar kind of story. I mean, this is very straightforward. This is really very straightforward. Um, which is nice. I mean, it's scratching that, a little bit of that itch at the same time, but there's not a lot of layers to this. There's not a lot of, of uh, you know, complexity and um, details to pull out. And there is, there is something going on in the finish, uh, which is making me unhappy. Let's try this one more time. Yeah, very space ID, very Glenlivet, a lot of black pepper on the palate. Then, once again, apples, pears, wildflowers, same variety of honeys, stewed cereal, muesli, cream of wheat, um, tea, the Ceylon tea thing again, um, cafe drinks, maybe a flat white or something. Um, Malted milk balls, lots of malty barley stuff. The finish is what concerns me. There is a kind of like old newspaper thing happening on the finish. It just gets kind of like, you know, uncomfortably bitter back there. It isn't really taking over, you know, again, this is very kind of forward in my mouth. And the finish doesn't hang on for very long. And there is that kind of like, you know, kind of bitter paper thing, which is not working in this thing's favor. But it is scratching that uh, that space ID itch. Let's see what happens when we add some water, though. I'm not going to add too much, like a squirt and a quarter or something like that. Um, and then we'll, we will move on to Koval. Uh, I've reviewed Koval before, and in that time I complained about the fact that basically they were not, a lot of their range was not bottled at higher strength. The, the entire range should really be 47%, like the four grain, and like their bourbon, but it isn't, and that's, that's a shame. Uh, but what I was, I remember also asking them to you know, finally put out some single barrels, and lo and behold, here they, here they have. I mean, I'm not everything they do is a single barrel, but I mean like a specialty, you know, store picky, high proof kind of single barrel. And they did. They did a bunch for Binnie's. Uh, uh, full disclosure: I work for them. I'm in the wine department. Um, the spirits folks don't really care about me, but I work there. Um, uh, now this one 
interested me because it's it's a three grain. So it's a little bit of a variation on the four grain they usually do. And the mash bill is rye, oat, and millet. Now they don't break down uh, the proportions there. Incidentally, this is barrel number 3924. Um, but I'm guessing the, 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 the dominance of the grains goes goes in order. So this is probably major, if not majority, then plurality rye, then oat, and then millet. Millet being our old friend sorghum, which you should know if you are any sort of Baijiu fan. <coughs> all right, so I am um, extremely curious about this for many reasons. First of all, because it's a hometown distillery, which is very cool, and I've had, I have a bit of a history with them. Second, because it is bottled at a, at a proper 55% alcohol by volume. You know, it's still, I think they're still very aging and in small barrels, which is not my favorite thing, but, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. And the other thing is this combination, this is apparently going to be a... Uh, predominantly rye and oat dominant mash, which I love. I, I I love to see oat whiskeys in general, and one of my dreams is to see like a, you know, like a. Uh, uh, I would love to see like a fifty-five, forty-five, five percent uh, uh, oat rye malt kind of of. of whiskey out there. I think that would be really fun. I think it would age really well. Um, but for the moment, I can I can only, you know, experience things like this. All right, let's see what we got. Here we go. On the nose, Koval, three grain, four binis. So we're really getting on the nose, like, uh, there's this kind of consistent Koval note, which is kind of on all their, their whiskeys. Of, like, a patisserie bakery, you know, making fresh desserty stuff. That's the main note. But behind that, there's this kind of herbaceous graininess. I think that's the rye. There's um, there's a lot of mint, dill, um, cilantro even. Push beyond that, there's a note which I can only describe as like barrel aged oatmeal stout. Those exist. I've had some of those. And some cough syrup. Um, Robitussin. Cherry Robitussin. This smells a little bit like an Amaro, actually. Like a like an Amaro with some gentian, some cherry, that kind of thing. Old, old tea leaves. Oatmeal. Like, like burned oatmeal, so you made a nice... Lice pot of oatmeal and then took a took a took a like chef's torch and just torched the top of it. That's kind of what I'm getting. And I almost spilled my Glen Levitt there. But happily Glen Cairns are made of sterner stuff. Alright. Um Yeah, so it's I mean you can tell this is this is basically a, a very young whiskey that's been hammered with oak pretty intensively in the short time that it's had on this on this earth but it kind of works when i first opened this bottle i really didn't like it and it's it's really growing on me actually all right here we go on the palate of this <coughs> god only knows what they did to this poor barrel that is a lot of oak it's very young it is not subtle, but I think it's basically good. Um, it does, again, same story as the Rappen. It does mostly hover around the front of my mouth, which is what's telling me that it's, it's quite young. Um, older spirits tend to push further back. Um, yeah, this, this kind of tastes like if you're trying to make a cocktail out of oatmeal stout and amaro but it kind of works it actually kind of works over stewed tea and yeah that kind of that kind of uh bakery patisserie kind of note there's some fennel in this too but it's really like mostly those first two notes it's that kind of very herbaceous gentian you know basil -y, herbaceous kind of amaro mixed with some oatmeal stout 
it's mostly that. It was more going on the nose, but this works. This actually works pretty darn well. There's some cherry coming out now. Um, I do wish they use, use proper casks. I do wish, you know, I, I wish a lot of things with Cobalt, but basically this works. So I'm going to add some water, see where it goes. Yeah, actually, that, that's about all that needs. I was, given the strength, I was expecting four squirts, but I think that's enough. I think three is enough. Like a quarter squirt more. Thank you for your patience while I figure this out. All right, let's go back through from the beginning. Back to the Awamori. Now with some water. Again, this was... was only 43% to begin with, so I didn't add a whole lot of water on the nose. Mm. Okay, so with water, this brightens up a little bit. There's a little bit more of that kind of sake note, the um, Junmai Jun Ginjo kind of note, but it also smells a little bit more like a light aroma baijo. Yeah, potatoes, rocks, dank cellar, all day long. It's fun. It's different. It's still... I still... So part of what's throwing me is the subtlety. That was really throwing me when I first opened this and was just trying to figure it out. <coughs> but even now that I've kind of adjusted to how, you know, turned down this is... Um, once I go looking for this, to, for those sort of, you know, second, third tier flavor profiles, I still don't really find a lot of them. And that's kind of, kind of my issue with this. I just want a little bit more on the palate. Not a lot of development on the palate compared to the nose. Uh, what was there is still there. It's, it's still got that kind of, you know, old-fashioned candy meets mushrooms meets dank cellar meets potatoes kind of thing. I mean, I haven't lot, spent a lot of time with, with traditional Japanese spirits. So... I feel any score I give this, I'm going to put a question mark in front of it because I feel like I don't quite have a grasp on the category. But um, just in general, I don't really know what to think of this. It's very, it's it's really subtle. It's food oriented, but it's subtle even for that purpose. Um, and this is also like forty bucks, so. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, this is a great bottle to grab if you if you want to, like, pop it with some friends just to get the experience of a radically different way of thinking about spirits. But, you know, would I, would I buy it, you know, in retrospect, would I buy it on my own to kind of have it just sitting around the house? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think, I don't think so. Um, Score-wise, let's give this a 79 question mark. Um, yeah, it's, it's not... I appreciate what it's doing. I just wish it was doing more things, not necessarily louder. I don't want this to be louder. This is, this is, I like the understated nature of this. I just want it to be doing more, if that makes sense. All right, moving on to the European Chironda Añejo. Um, let's see what happens now with water. Okay, as expected, um, the yolk kind of comes out a little bit more. A little sawdust happening now, but even more than that, the uh, the column still stuff has kind of come out a little bit more. There's a, even more like like whipped cream kind of thing is going on. It's less weird. It's less Claren like. It's more kind of settled. It's more. It's like it's just you know said to itself, okay, I'm done. I'm done having fun. Still a fun guy, but I'm done having fun right now, and I'm 
I'm ready to, to go into a cocktail now. I'm ready to be thrown into a mojito or something. It's a good nose. It's, it's the, those, those same kinds of like fruity herbaceous things which were more dominant without water are still there. They're just playing around in the background, giving this a little halo. Nice. On the palate, here we go. Same kind of story. Not as much development in the palate as in the nose. Um, mostly the same set of flavors as, as I was getting before. That that subtle mix of like you know vanilla and coke and but also like the savory touches, the 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 brine, the sea water, the the um, olives. What this does do is kick up the peppery element, the kind of uh, white peppery element, and it extends the finish. Uh, the, the, this is now pushing a little bit further back into my mouth, and it's holding for just a hair bit longer. Yeah, I'm into this. I don't think it's actually better than the European white rum, but you could absolutely still do the same kind of build a bar around it kind of thing with this. Um, this is ready for cocktailing, y'all. Like this is um, this is kind of a just a do it all, you know, lightly aged rum. So um, if you have cocktail needs in that category and you just want something lying around that you can reach for, I think this would be a great choice. And I will give it 84 out of 100. Um, really nice. Really nice. Good stuff. Um, 30 bucks. All right, moving on to the Glenlivet, the illicit still. Let's see what happens with water. Mm -mm. So, so a lot of those heavier notes I was getting before the, um, the peppers and the, like the, the the flat white latte kinds of notes. I've kind of lifted from this. This has become, this now seems on the nose much more light and aromatic. It's almost like Glen Kinchy. So there's a lot of pear and apple and, you know, a streak of vanilla, oaky stuff running through it. But that's kind of it. Um, okay, let's see what happens in the palette. Um, Mm. Ooh. So that's concerning. So with water, this kind of falls apart a little bit, um, which is bad when the uh, when the appealing factor in this is the higher ABV. Um, it's just kind of this grassy, floral, pear, apple, honeyed stuff now. And the finish is just kind of short and awkward. Um, the coffee and teeth are there, but in the finish, but then there's just this clipped kind of nature and a little bit of like an uncomfortable bitterness, that kind of newspapery note. Mm -hmm. Be honest y'all like this is a little bit of a disappointment for me um like i think of glenlivet as being perfectly capable you know especially in its upper level more special limited edition kinds of releases which this is even though it's not that expensive as being you know kind of a quality distillery but this is this ain't showing it like this is it's solid but it's disappointing um that's all I got to say. Uh, this is an 83 point whiskey. 83 points. And, uh, yeah. Um, I 
yeah. Definitely a space side whiskey if you just need need a space side whiskey, but uh, certainly certainly nothing uh, worthy of standing in the shadow of the old uh, Nadura 16. Let's move on um, to the Koval three grain. Now with a splash of water. <laughs> so on the nose, this gets like just more and more Amaro like really. I'm getting gentian, tree bark. Gentian is a flavor note you, you, you need to know, by the way. Just, um, just find an Amaro that's very gentian heavy and, and study that flavor note because it shows up a lot. A lot of just tree barky stuff, fennel. Um, red fruit, like dried red fruit, rhubarb. But then there's that like oatmeal stout character to this and that slight herbaceousness. I mean, it's, it's good, but you have, it, this, this takes some time to get used to. It's very distinctive. Distinctive in that way where it's not clear that whether it's, whether this, the distinctiveness is good or bad. You know what I mean? On the palate. Also, Amaro's up even more. Uh, the finish is actually quite long. It holds on for a long, long time in the front of my mouth. But again, it's still quite short. It's quite clipped. It does not proceed past, you know, basically the middle of my teeth. It's all on the front. <clears throat> yeah. Amaro and some mixed herbs and some oatmeal stout. That's most of what's going on here. But there's a nice, I really like the kind of grippy, peppery finish on this, even though it's kind of short in my mouth. Um, this is personal taste. This is a personal taste thing. I could see a lot of people, reasonable people, dismissing this as just like craft distilled crap where they're, and that's that's part of the barrels. like. Caval just needs to step up and start using larger barrels. They just, they just do, they just do. It's not their their biggest problem. The, their biggest problem is the bottling strength of most of their range, uh, which this one doesn't have. You know, buy this one if, that, if that's your your issue with them. Um, but they need to start, you know, just using larger barrels. Um, but I like it. It's 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 baroque. But I'm into this. This is uh, this is a very fun bottle. I did give this an 85. I don't think it's that good. I think this is like an 84 plus. Um, but I'm gonna give. I will give it that 84 plus. Uh, yeah, let's leave it at that. 84 plus for the Caval three grain thing for Benny's. Um, well worth a shot if you still see it out there, but know what you're getting into. Um, it's it's very distinctive and weird, uh, and that's that's my shopping bag for the day. We've got uh, seventy nine question mark for the Aromori. My heart is with this, but I just I, I want more from it. Um, you're up on, I mean, in terms of value, this is the winner of the episode by miles. Like, this is 30 bucks. It is half the price of the Koval. This is 30 bucks. Go buy this. Um, 84 points for the Europa and Añejo. The Glenlivet Illicit Still. Not bad, but kind of a disappointment. 83 points. And the Koval. Um, craft weirdness, but nice. Uh, 84 plus. And uh, that's my lineup. Thanks for watching and cheers.